They protect us. They defend us. They help us in times of need. But they're being destroyed from within. Last year saw more army suicides than any year on record. Day. Our son was just one of thousands of veterans that this country has lost to suicide. After day. Only to die here at home in their sleep. After day. He then used a pistol to take his own life. There is a hidden enemy at work. It's got to stop. And it's hiding in plain sight. The most dangerous enemy is the one you never suspect. I spent uh, almost 26 years on active duty in the Marine Corps. I retired with the grade of Brigadier General. I was an Army Captain in the Aviation Branch. I was a Staff Sergeant E-5 in the United States Air Force. I was in the United States Marine Corps from 2007 to 2011. Florida Army National Guard. 31st Engineering Battalion. I was an Aviation and Military Intelligence. Battlefield Intelligence Analyst. I was a U.S. Navy Fighter Pilot. Combat Medic with an LPN license. So my nomenclature would be a 68 Whiskey Mike 6. I got out as a, uh, as a sergeant, uh, non-commissioned officer, uh, this past March. I didn't see the emergence of psychiatry in the Army up until I suffered my own injury. And then it was like, it was a flood. It was a flood of doctors and it was a flood of meds. There's just as much stress on today's soldier as in the past. Long hours, grueling missions, extended periods away from loved ones. And when mental and emotional problems strike, there's no doubting their reality. A lot of money has been spent trying to handle this problem. The US Pentagon now pays out $2 billion a year on mental health alone. And the Veterans Administration's mental health budget has gone ballistic shooting up from less than $3 billion in 2007 to nearly $7 billion in 2014. With all this spending, why do things continue to get worse? Because in today's military, once a person is diagnosed with a psychiatric illness, the almost inevitable result is a prescription for a psychiatric drug. And psychiatric drugs are being prescribed a lot. I joined the Navy when I was 17, and I was, I retired, I was medically discharged, I should say, from the SEAL teams. I served my country with America's best in a time of war, and I had the honor of leading them. But I did lose, you know, my swim buddy, which is my, the guy you go through SEAL training with. And that gave me a survivor's guilt that I can't begin to describe. And, you know, I make it through combat in multiple firefights and nothing. I, I got blown up by an IED, it broke my neck, you know, and I didn't know it at the time. But, but I lived with that for like five years, make it through all of that. And they, you know, I come back and they almost kill me with pills. The drugging of the U.S. military is off the charts. From 2005 to 2011, the U.S. Department of Defense increased its prescriptions of psychiatric drugs by nearly seven times. That's over 30 times faster than civilians. In total, over the last 10 years, the U.S. government has spent more than $4.5 billion just medicating soldiers and veterans. In fact, in 2011, the Pentagon spent more on pills, injections, and vaccines than on Black Hawk helicopters, Abrams tanks, Hercules C-130 cargo planes, and Patriot missiles combined. The use of both psychiatry and psychotropic drugs has just ballooned in the U.S. military. Every soldier that I've talked to, every time they've seen a psychiatrist, 
they would prescribe them some kind of psychotropic drug right off the bat. I would say 60 to 70 percent of the soldiers we saw in our in our center uh, were on medication. Let me give you an example. I was on a uh, on a committee, a scholarship committee for veterans at a, at a college, and they invited the VA psychiatrist to come in to give a talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. But at the very end, I raised my hand, I said, how many of your veterans that you see do you medicate? And initially he tried to skirt the answer. He said, I see the most difficult. And I said, we all see the most difficult. How many do you medicate? 98%. It's criminal. Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, is the most widespread diagnosis in the U.S. military. It used to be considered a nervous reaction, an expected part of combat. But psychiatrists today label it a brain dysfunction. This war isn't any different than any other than guys coming back with shell shock, um, battle fatigue or combat fatigue. And, and you know now they're calling it post-traumatic stress disorder. It's, it's been around forever. Today, 37% of recent war veterans are being treated for PTSD. Once labeled, 80% will be given psychiatric drugs. And of those vets drugged, 89% are put on antidepressants and 34% powerful antipsychotics. Even after one of the world's top PTSD psychiatrists did a study acknowledging that antipsychotics don't work. Just because a medication can be widely prescribed doesn't mean necessarily that it's really helpful for the overall for the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Antidepressants have also proven ineffective for the psychic wounds of battle, with several recent wide-ranging meta-analyses showing them to work no better than placebo. There's a bigger problem with psychiatric drugs, though. No one, not even the prescriber, knows what side effects will occur once they are taken. My friends that take the drugs that I'm prescribed uh, have very bad balance, um, a terrible memory. Uh, they have different, difficult talking clearly, speaking clearly to each other. Their reaction times are very slow and they, they have a hard time concentrating. It pretty much just erased all feelings that I had. So I was just there. A lack of motivation, really. I just stopped caring. I was constantly demotivated, um, very worn down all the time. I was constantly sleepy, like not tired, just sleepy. I could stop doing something and instantly fall asleep. One minute you can be on patrol, next minute you'd be asleep. That's what those pills do to you. They make you tired. I would get headaches, but it's not like a normal headache. It, it would be like sharp pains just zapping through my head. I was up to almost 300 pounds. I was in metabolic syndrome. My body had, my adrenal system had completely shut down. My muscles had seemingly turned to water and I could not lose weight for anything. These are supposed to be the finest, most elite soldiers, um, you know, physical combat machines and they're being given something that's harming them. That's destroying not only their body physically, but also their minds mentally. All psychiatric meds are mind-altering drugs. People don't put that together, uh, but they're mind-altering, and they have side effects, disaster side effects. One of the most significant problems about every psychotropic drug that I can think of, the uh, stimulants, the uh, tranquilizers, antipsychotics, mood modulators, are unpredictable. I can give the same drug to 20 different men and they'll have 10 different reactions to it. Despite this, official reports state that one in six American service members is on at least one psychiatric drug. But here's the thing. According to the Armed Services Committee of the United States Senate, no one knows how many drugs are given to soldiers downrange. There's no paper trail, no prescriptions, they're just handed out. Fact is, the amount of psychiatric drugging in the military is probably much, much higher. And yet, on top of the many sometimes serious side effects you may experience with psychiatric drugs, 
is the strangest fact of all. They don't cure anything. So what do they do? They alter your behavior by deadening your feelings. This not only prevents a person from sorting things out, but numbs them to the world around them. There is even a name for it, depersonalization. I've had patients who've been um, given very large doses of psychoactive drugs over a period of about a year and uh, basically destroyed their, their sense of self. They don't care almost about anything. You could go up to someone and start yelling at them and if they're on the large enough cocktail, they won't do anything. They become almost drones. So they're literally lobotomizing our soldiers with these drugs, I'm sorry. That's, I'm just being very direct and honest with my experience of over 200 injured warriors. It's almost like being in a mental hospital with lobotomies, lobotomized patients, I'm sorry. It's just awful. And the depersonalization gets really dangerous when the drug creates another common side effect. If someone is numbed like that, they're less likely to be concerned about their consequences of their behavior and might resort then to impulsive actions, violent actions. Having all these fits of anger, aggression, they're getting in fights with their significant other. And of course, what this has led to is just a, a really horrendous number of uh, domestic shootings, domestic beatings, child, wife, uh, abuse. The numbers back it up. Since 2006, violent sex crimes and domestic abuse in the military have increased more than 30%, and child abuse is up 43, all while the psychiatric drugging of our troops has been going out the roof. And then there are the cases where a soldier under the influence of psychiatric drugs loses it all. May 11, 2009. Sergeant John Russell opens fire in an Army combat stress clinic in Baghdad. He kills two officers and three enlisted. The day before, his psychiatrist had prescribed him antidepressants. March 11, 2012. In a remote village in Afghanistan, Staff Sergeant Robert Bales murders 16. Nine were children. Before his murder spree, Bales had snorted the psychiatric drug Valium. September 16, 2013. Navy veteran Aaron Alexis brings a shotgun to Washington, D.C.'s Navy Yard, where he kills 12 people. According to reports, Alexis had been prescribed the antidepressant Trazodone. He talked about it. He said he went to the um, VA and they would give him some medicine. There's Army Private First Class David Lawrence, who murdered a Taliban commander in his prison cell while on Zoloft in Trazodone. Terence Tyler, a former Marine who gunned down two co-workers, then himself, at a New Jersey supermarket. He had been diagnosed with major depression and was taking Prozac. And Eddie Ray Routh, who murdered a decorated Navy SEAL. He had just gotten out of a mental hospital four days earlier where he had been treated for PTSD. Drugs and weapons do not mix, okay? It's a recipe for disaster all by itself. They're seeing things different. Their mind has been altered, their brain has been altered. Their judgment and reasoning is, is not what it would have been without these medications. It's the mind that makes the decision of when to shoot and what to shoot. It's the mind. If you alter the mind and you imbalance the mind, which is what psychiatric drugs do, you change the results of who or what gets shot on the battlefield or at home after the battle is over. It's alarming enough that psychiatric drugs given to soldiers are so closely linked to such sudden and senseless violence. There's also the matter of what they might do to themselves. Ever since I was a little kid, you know, I always loved the military. I loved the army. And I I think I always knew that I wanted to, you know, join. And it was right after combat. So, you know, I started getting these uh, dreams and flashbacks and all that stuff. And then, you know, kind of like big anxiety and all that stuff. And 
And I went to my doc and uh, they said, yeah, we, you know, we, get, we gotta get you some meds, you know, and they gave me them and, you know, that was it. You take your meds and you can just start feeling going down and then you're just like, bam, and you're just a, you're a zombie, you know? My body was breaking down and my wife, she, you know, she's saying, this isn't right. And then one, uh, Yeah, I was all drunk and uh, and uh, you know, the meds just taking that shit. And I just said, I'm done. And uh, I took my pistol, I put it in my mouth, and, I was, and she opened up the door. I took him, and I said, I, I was like, this is so, I said, something's, we gotta do something, you know, and it just, this shit just didn't work, you know, and uh, I knew I wasn't me, you know, it was the drug that was, was doing it, and, and I knew I had to change, or I'd be dead, and that's why I changed it. There is a huge problem with suicides in the military. Since 2002, the rate in the U.S. ranks has almost doubled. The suicide rate has really been going out the roof here lately with our military members, uh, both while they're still in and once they return back to the States. I would move from base to base to base, and I'd, I'd be on different missions at different times. Um, and one minute I'm on a base, and I'm having lunch, and I'm being asked, hey, did you hear about those those three guys, who, those three soldiers who committed suicide? It was a uh, black eye on, on Fort Bliss. Soldiers were dying left and right. Uh, preventable deaths, we're talking suicides, we're talking about uh, these soldiers getting in their cars going, or motorcycles going 150 miles an hour and you know hitting a, a median, um, family violence. Uh, it, it, it really spiraled out of control. With all this happening, psychiatric drugs continue to be handed out in volume. Drugs well known to increase violence and suicidal thinking. My psychiatrist at the time uh, had uh, issued me a recommended gabapentin. And uh, I took one and I think within 30 minutes I had thoughts of suicide. They started me on a really low dose to build it in my system. But even the low dose, I was still feeling side effects of suicide depression, anxiety. I did notice that there was a lot of times that I thought, you know, that it would just be better to be dead than to keep living like that. And I look back on it now and I, I do realize that it was the meds. Yes, there can be reasons for suicide in today's military that don't involve psychiatric drugs. But it would be stupid to ignore the drug's influence. Just ask the troops with boots on the ground. I was military police, um, actively working as a police officer on the military installation. And in one week, I went to about eight or nine suicide attempts where the person either overdosed or, you know, said that he was going to kill himself, something like that. And one for one, every single person was on psychiatric drugs. Because of my role as a criminal investigator, I didn't witness the soldiers while they were taking psychiatric drugs. All I got to see was after the suicide or after the death, and then the reports come out. We'd get called pretty often to investigate. We would have an autopsy performed and would uh, include a toxicological exam, which would determine any drugs in the system, and usually there was some type of drug. A lot of them were taking some sort of medication, uh, for depression or anxiety. There were a lot of suicides happening in the military, um, overseas in theater and back in the States. From 2009 to 2012, more U.S. soldiers died by suicide than from traffic accidents, heart disease, cancer, and homicide. Some have claimed that this is because of the stresses of war but 85% of military suicides never even saw combat, and 52% never deployed. Meanwhile, 
the safety of psychiatric drugs is never even questioned, and it's resulting in suicide attempts such as this one. My son joined the Army. He wanted to make a career and become something. He was still sweet and, and more normal when he came back from Iraq, even though he had you know, nervousness in crowds and PTSD. Uh, he was not different in personality as far as, you know, to that degree, like what we saw later on the drugs. And so when Michael said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm having anxiety issues, I said, you need to go tell them. Well, and that's what really began his journey. That was the, you know, that was the, the worst step, that, in my opinion, that we could have ever done. You know, it started off with one drug and went to two. With each successive um, symptom that he got, he got a new drug. And we noticed that he started to go down in personality. It wasn't our son anymore. It was, you know, anger, slurred speech. It was surreal because the person I was talking to wasn't even my son. He was unsure of himself. He didn't have any, um, any will to do anything. Um, at one point, he had stopped brushing his teeth, drinking water, eating because he didn't care. He didn't even know that he was that way. I was in the dollar store and he called me and said, I don't want to upset you, but I want you to know Michael's okay. But he tried to kill himself and he put two IVs in his arms and he bled out in the bathtub and he was drawing in his blood on the walls. He didn't even know he was committing suicide. His cognizance, his reason, was already usurped by these pills. You know, they take away who you are. And he wasn't the same. We had the hospital check him and they found at least nine drugs in his system. And they're just the ones they tested for. They were giving my son drugs that had black box warnings, said, if you're under 25 and you're taking this pill, your risk of suicide is going up 50%. Risk of suicide. But they were still giving the pills. What he went through was so horrific, it's hard for him to talk about. But he allows us to speak because he wants to save his comrades. He wants to save others who are going through the same thing, who are being drugged with lethal cocktails. The serious risk of suicide of some of these drugs is something rarely discussed. Why not? Because those FDA black box warnings for 18 to 24 year olds that's the age range of 41% of all deployed American soldiers. And yet, the use of psychiatric drugs in the US military has soared 76% since 2001. That includes antidepressants that psychiatrists hand out to soldiers to prevent suicide. There is no evidence, there is no evidence that drugging stops suicide. The reason I'm, I'm saying this is because it is alleged that if somebody is suicidal, you should medicate them. Except there's no evidence that medicating somebody who is suicidal is going to prevent suicide. There's substantial evidence that many drugs actually promote suicide. And last year, within the DOD, uh, there were 349 suicides among uh, military personnel. That's almost one a day, literally one a day. That's more suicides than were killed in combat. And the military is very concerned. In fact, in uh, 2009, Fort Campbell, Kentucky was actually closed down by the base commander for a time because of they were having just an inordinate number of suicides. Suicides on Fort Campbell have to stop now. The last I heard, the VA was getting close to 450 calls a day to their suicide hotline, which they set up years ago to handle the amount of veterans that have suicidal thoughts on a daily basis. 450 calls a day. It's a problem that has echoed through the halls of government. One of the biggest concerns I have about the military is the inordinate number of suicides that have taken place among active duty and those who've left the military. And we need to find out the causes of that. Stress in combat, of course, is one, but there's a growing number of scientists and doctors around the world who believe that 
psychotropic drugs are a contributing factor. And we need to find out for sure. And for that reason, I think we need to have congressional hearings and find out all the reasons that these suicides are taking place. Three years ago, I got Congress to hold hearings to examine the relationship between suicide and increased use of medications. And there was a direct parallel. The amount of suicides were increasing proportionate to the amount of medications being introduced. So do antidepressants cause suicide? Of course they do. And as bad as it is in active duty, veterans have it far worse. They are killing themselves at a rate of 22 a day, one every 65 minutes. And yet, in the face of all this needless death, our soldiers and veterans continue to be given prescriptions for drugs that have devastated whole families and communities. And many are speaking out. I don't want another family to experience what we've experienced. Unfortunately, that's happening. This is an outrage. What's going on here? Are, are, are these young people just guinea pigs? Apparently so. My daughter was a guinea pig. And she's gone. One of Tony's last things, you know, he always told me, just keep speaking up, Mom. Even if you only help one person, just keep speaking up. My goal is not just to tell Anthony's story, but I feel it's a story that's not unique. It's something that's happening to so many of our troops. As an advocate for my son and an advocate for wounded veterans across the country, our group that I work with, uh, we're trying to make a change in that direction. So we made it our mission that we're gonna tell everybody we can and have the website, have as much information that we can. We've gotta get the word out to our soldiers, don't take these drugs, don't take these drugs. It's the beginning of the end. We are facing a crisis in our military, a psychiatric drug epidemic that has remained hidden and yet has been wreaking untold damage on our men and women in uniform. Billions of dollars are being spent and it's harming our troops. Immediate action is necessary. It is our turn to protect those who have done so much to protect us.